on this computer. Look at the chat. Okay, just a reminder as people kind of check in, make sure that you go to the chat and enter your name so that I can make sure you're listed for your attendance. So Joe, we typically have maybe anywhere from 60 to 80 people who attend, could be more, never know. I just kind of make sure I'm plugged in so I don't die. And Joe, you may want to mute your microphone. Okay, sorry. That's okay. Let me get my picture up there and get rid of you. I get I get I'm, I'm on. Carlin, so, I'm going to mute your microphone, okay? I'm sorry, say it again. I'm going to mute your microphone, okay? Okay. All right. Just a reminder to everybody, as people start checking in, make sure that you go to the chat and sign in. I'm going to ask her. Hey, Barb, this is Tom so they Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. I'm part of the... Um, program today briefly about one minute Jim gave me one minute today so I'll be I'll unmute right now I'll, I'll mute it right now got it you know you Thanks. might want to lower your your camera because all I see is like the top of your yeah, yeah. yeah I'll try to look cute you have a beautiful ceiling but I think it's so much nicer to see your face can you give can you her the me? after work or something we want celery and grapes too rotary I'm going to go to Bork's or Carrie and supper on back tomorrow night with the Lanes. She's invited six of us. I mean, there'll be six. I'm going to say oh. yes. Yeah. David Bywater, I'm glad you've got your dad, Bill, there. Did you want to say something to Barbara? To Barbara? Yes, ahead of Barb Thomas. Well, I always enjoy talking to Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't? I've been a fan of hers for a lot of years. Wow, that's like a paid endorsement. The best year is coming up. Okay, let's cross our fingers. Hopefully you'll get to see me in person, right? We'll be, we'll be fine. You bet. Looking forward to it. Yes. Okay. Barb, I'm on. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Jim, loud and clear. 
All right. Thanks for running the show again this week. You bet. Ask if you're signed. Am I signed in, Barb? Uh, I've got you, Carlin. Okay. At the beginning I of the meeting, as people enter, I try to keep track of it, but after a while, I can't. Oh. And since it's. Why do you get rid of your picture on top there if you want to? Your for, our photograph up by can you do that? So are you seeing like a small you at the top or something? Oh, yeah, a small picture of me. Yeah, you know, pretty much you're always going to see a little pit, a little picture of you. Um, can you? All right, that's fine. At the top, does it say speaker view or guest or um, or gallery view? I don't say anything. Let it go. Don't worry about it. Okay. Deal. So again, a reminder for everybody as you uh, enter in, if you could uh, sign into the chat, that would be great. Much appreciated. Yeah, it is. What did you do with the tape so I can put it back? Oh, I see there's some here. Never mind, I found a roll. What, what did you say? Oh, well, I want to put the tape back on after a bit. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. So welcome everybody. Just a reminder, as you have logged in, please go to the chat box that you'll see at the bottom. Click on that and enter your name so that we know that you have attended. Thank you. This is going to be kind of interesting. What about today? About the making of the Niall Finnick, Finnick movie. Oh. Nice. Come in and listen. Good afternoon, everybody. Just a reminder, as you enter, please go to the chat box at the bottom of your screen and enter your name. And if possible, please uh, mute your microphone. Thank you. Welcome everyone that's on the uh, call so far. It's uh, 12 o'clock. Uh, we've been beginning our meetings at about 12.03 just uh, to make sure we're including everyone. So we'll begin in about three minutes. And just a reminder as you log in, please uh, come in, go to the chat box at the bottom, type your name so that we can make sure that your attendance is registered. And if you know somebody who is unable to get onto Zoom or they have a lot of questions, we're always happy to help people out. But remember, um, we do take these meetings and we post them to YouTube. 
um, so the members can see that. That does make me question, Joe Heath, our speaker today, can you let me know, is it okay for us to um, put your talk up on a public site? Yeah, that's fine. Great, thank you. <laughs> Again, welcome to everyone that's on so far. We're going to begin in about two minutes. Please make sure you go out to the chat box and enter your attendance. Could be a record day, Barb. I see we're getting up to 70 already. That's and great. Typically, uh, between about noon and 12:10, we get 20 or 25 more. So, great to see numbers continuing to rise. Chat. Sign in on chat. Just a reminder to everybody, please go to the chat box at the bottom and sign your name so that we know you're here. You can also like write a message to somebody in the chat box. Say hello. Tell us about your big news if you'd like to. Feel free to use it. All right. Well, uh, by my watch, it's 12.03. So we'll go ahead and begin as we always do with the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. So. If you are able, uh, please join me in standing as we recite the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, stands the nation under God, visible, visible, and justice for all. Okay, thank you. Feedback. Well, Barb, we'll go ahead. Jim, uh, let's see, I just need to unmute. Jim, can you unmute yourself? I had to mute all. Thank you. Yes, thank you for doing that, Barb. All right, well, we'll go ahead and begin. Uh, I think we're gonna have record attendance today, so I appreciate uh, so many folks joining us. Uh, we obviously have a very exciting program ahead, uh, and I'm uh, very much looking forward to that. So uh, I'd like to begin with a little welcome and uh, a little uh, rotary news for the group. Uh, our Rotary Board uh, has a meeting coming up later this month, and we're going to be discussing a number of items. We already have been via email, but uh, this month uh, we're going to be uh, talking in depth about uh, member retention and outreach. We're very pleased with the number of participants in these calls. I think our record so far at, uh, at one point has been 93, 94 participants. Uh, today, we're probably already at the 80 or uh, so mark and on the way up. So while we're very excited about the fact that we've been able to hold these meetings virtually, uh, we certainly miss uh, our meetings in person and we certainly miss some members. Not everyone is able to join us for uh, various reasons and we remain aware of that and concerned about that. And we want to continue to do whatever we can to reach out to every single member. So. At our board meeting this month, our board's gonna talk about member retention and member outreach. And if you, anyone, has input or ideas on ways that we as a group can include everyone and make every Rotarian that's in the Iowa City Noon Rotary Club uh, feel active and a part of our group, uh, by all means, reach out to any Rotary board member, myself or anyone, 
and we'd love to hear feedback from you. So uh, member engagement and retention is very, very important to us. And uh, while we're happy that these meetings have been successful, and we've got such great participation, uh, we know there are folks that we're not able to reach and we want to uh, think about ways that we can be an intentional about reaching out to them. Uh, in a related note, uh, as you may have heard, there are some steps being taken that uh, some restaurants will be open. Uh, so already uh, we've had some interest from club members on uh, uh, the board's thoughts about uh, when we might have in-person meetings. And the best news I can give you at this point is that, well, it's on the radar and we plan to talk about it. So uh, that's the first step. And there are certainly very, very many considerations uh, that will, uh, things that need to be taken into consideration before any such decisions can take place. And it's very, very early on in uh, the consideration of, of uh, these options. But I uh, just want to let the, the full membership know that. Uh, the subject will be discussed again on our board meeting on the 26th and uh, any news uh, we will be happy to uh, pass along um, and uh, more to come on that but obviously while the health of all of our members is our primary concern uh, we just feel there's such value in the ability to meet together as a group so we want to keep all options open and uh, talk about those things as, as uh, soon and diligently as we can. So more to come on that. Uh, next, uh, as we do, I'd like to have Barb, I think we're kind of getting to be Zoom experts here, all of us, aren't we? But I'm sure we don't know everything. So Barb, I'd like to turn it over to you to give us any Zoom tips you think we might need this week. You bet. Bit by bit, we're, we are becoming experts. Just a reminder that at the top right of your screen, you should see the option to go to speaker view or gallery view. If you're in gallery view, you'll see all those little images of people, but we highly recommend that as we go into announcements and especially for our speaker, that you go to speaker view so that you'll see a large image of our speaker. Um, in addition, remember at the bottom of your screen, there is the mute your microphone button and there's a video button. Uh, it looks like a little video camera. You can always choose to stop the video. And if so, then either your name or if you put a picture into your profile, that will pop up. Um, if for some reason our speaker, if it starts to get kind of choppy and we're having trouble with the bandwidth, that would be when I would ask you to please go to, um, to stop your video. And if so, you'll see a little line through that video screen. Again, make sure that you use the chat button to register your attendance. Um, any other questions, et cetera. Also, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a button that says participants. And so in that is where, if you click on that, um, a little box will come up. And in that box, there is a button that says raise hand. And we will use that for when we introduce guests, when we have announcements, and then also if we have questions for our speaker. So I think that's it, back to you, Jim. All right, thank you, Barb. Now, also, in addition, this week, uh, we did a group mute. Uh, sometimes with uh, you know, climbing, I see we have uh, in the mid 80s now, members joining already and climbing. Uh, sometimes there's some background noise that can interrupt the meeting. So Barb did a group mute. So if you have a, a, visitor, a visitor that you'd like to introduce or an announcement you'd like to make here shortly, the first thing you need to do is click unmute. So uh, that would be a red microphone icon at the bottom of your screen. So when you would like to speak, click unmute to make sure we can hear you. So uh, with that, we would like to uh, introduce our guests. So I, I see on the participant list, a uh, few names of, uh, of folks that might be joining us as guests. So uh, if you have a guest with you or you are a guest or you're a visiting Rotarian, please click unmute and uh, raise your hand and uh, Barb will uh, call on you in the order that uh, she sees your, your name, your hand raised. Please just tell us your name and uh, where you're visiting from. Barb, do we have any hands raised? We do. First off, we have Tara Minetto. Hello, I have a special guest today. You're gonna hear a little bit more about her in the announcement section. We have Olivia Baird, who is the recipient of the Rotarian Supporting Women Scholarship. Olivia wants to say hi real quick. Hi, I'm Olivia. Um, Great. 
should I introduce myself or? You know, let's just do that. Let's turn it over to you. Tara, do you want to just say a couple more words about Olivia? And uh, then Olivia, let's, we might as well hear from you now. Tara, go ahead and do a little intro. Okay, um, as I said, she received our inaugural 2019 Rotarian Sporting Women Scholarship. She's an Iowa City native and she most impressed our committee with her commitment to service above self, balancing her academics, employment, um, exemplary community service as well as her academics before attending the University of Iowa. Um, she's overcome some obstacles and she's a great candidate. Do you want to tell us a little more, Olivia? Cool. Uh, thank you, Tara. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Olivia. I am a freshman, almost sophomore at the University of Iowa, and I have one more final left, so that's why I said uh, almost. But um, this past year has been kind of crazy, obviously. Um, I've loved starting university. Um, my classes are super awesome. My professors are incredible people, and I'm just so excited to finally be within a professional um, field and, like, get more experience within, like, um, my preferred direction of life, um, which I want to go into the medical field, preferably um, pre-PA, um, so physician's assistant. Sometimes people don't know what PA stands for, so I will specify. Um, <clears throat> and I did live in the dorms, but I don't live there right now, obviously, because they told us to go home. Um, so I am living with my boyfriend right now, and this scholarship has helped a lot because my family doesn't have enough money to um, help me go to college, and I need to also be responsible for myself. So I, in order to pay for college, I would probably have to be working 40-hour weeks um, on top of having a full schedule. So this scholarship has helped tremendously. I still work like 12, 15 hour weeks on top of my schoolwork, but um, no, the scholarship has definitely helped me like ease stress and um, focus a lot more on my academics. Olivia, congratulations on the scholarship and uh, thanks for uh, joining us today. And uh, very importantly, good luck with your last final. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Next. Uh, Tara, thanks. Yes, go ahead. Next, we have Hazel Seba. Uh, hello to everybody. I am a uh, visiting Rotarian from the Iowa City AM Club. Nice to see everybody. Yes, thanks for visiting us. Appreciate it, Hazel. And next, Chris Atchison. Hi, uh, thank you, Barb. Uh, my guest is uh, Steve Wolf, uh, who recently uh, retired from the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Iowa. He's, of course, a family practitioner, former president of the Iowa Academy of Family Practice. Steve, are you there? Yes, I am. Uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, view this presentation and learn more about Niall Kinnick, who I think we all view as probably one of Iowa's ultimate role models. So I'm excited to hear the presentation. Thank you, everyone. Great, Steve, thanks for joining us. Nice to see you. And I'll mention Steve's from Spencer, Iowa. So he's obviously a great guy. <laughs> Welcome, Steve. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. You bet. Uh, Barb, do uh, we have other names? Uh, we do not. No more guests. All right. All right. Uh, is there anyone I would like? Guests. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, hold on a minute. I think, is that Ryan? Yeah, I I tried to raise my hand. I think I gave a thumbs up instead, so sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've got two guests, both big Hawkeye fans and both uh, familiar to our club as they've been guests a couple times now, but I've got Alyssa uh, Brant Jarrett, who uh, is with Brant Heating and Air Conditioning. And I've got uh, Bill Easton, who runs uh, Easton Design, a website development and design firm. So welcome, guys. I know they're both looking forward to the program as well. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Ryan. And I'll give you two thumbs up for inviting guests. Appreciate that. I welcome Alyssa and Bill. I actually do have two more hands. I have Phil has his hand up. Phil? Hi, visiting Rotarian Phil Peterson from the Iowa City AM Club. So happy to join you guys, and uh, you continue to do a great job with the Zoom meetings. So thanks for inviting me. Yes, Phil, and thanks for all your uh, leadership, too, of ICARP. Uh, for those that aren't familiar, ICARP's the Iowa City Area Rotary Presidents. Uh, that group's become uh, 
more and more uh, important to us as uh, it's great for the Rotary clubs in our area to uh, talk about uh, all of these unique challenges we're facing and how we can work together in new ways or how we can share ideas on the best ways to move forward. But Phil, thanks for all your work uh, for a Rotary and for ICON. And we do have one more. Uh, we have one more guest, uh, Anna Moyer Stone with an exclamation point. Anna is going to introduce a guest. Um, hi, with me I have uh, my constant companion and my daughter, Sylvia. And we are both wearing our Hawkeye gear today. So we are very festive and excited to join you guys. Yay, all right. Well, we're glad to have you, Sylvia. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> Great. And so I don't think, I think with that, we have no more guests. Just a reminder to everyone, please go to the chat box and sign in. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Barb. Okay. Uh, well, uh, hopefully uh, everyone that's on the call has had the chance to uh, participate in a meeting or two here recently. But if you haven't, uh, I'd just like to add that this next part is one of our favorite parts of the meetings. It's called the Rotary Moment of Positivity and Gratitude. Obviously, there's various challenges that everyone's facing these days, and uh, we just felt like it's been a fun thing and a, a kind of a positive way to begin our meetings with a rotary moment of positivity and gratitude. And today's moment is going to be provided by Tom Selick. Tom, I'd like to turn it over to you. Oh, Tom, go ahead. Let's have you unmute, Tom. Can you unmute, Tom? Here we go. Here Perfect. We now? Yes, we can, Tom. Go right ahead. Well, thanks for the opportunity. As most of you know, I work at West Bank. I work with Jim, part of the team. I'm sort of the uh, senior member of the team. And um, so as the senior members, occasionally I share my, my wisdom from my old age, and we call this Tips from Tom. So today I'm giving you Tips from Tom. It's, it's got a little bit of a football theme. I'm a, I'm a fan of Chris Doyle, who is the Iowa football strength and conditioning coach. And, I follow Chris on Twitter, and he has a, a lot of thoughtful things to say. And uh, So today, I'm going to share with you well, one of his Twitter posts. These are the um, nine things to do for those who are aiming for excellence. So it's a list of nine things. I'll list them one by one by one. Number one, wake up with purpose. Number two, become a lifelong learner. Number three, love the process. Number four, take failure as learning. Number five, do the extra work. Number six, have a game plan to each day. Number seven, don't entertain drama. Number eight, be optimistic and driven. And number nine, stay disciplined. So I think one of the secrets of a success of Iowa football is, uh, is really Chris is uh, working with his, the student athletes both in conditioning and in their mental preparation. Thanks, Jim. Well, thank you, Tom. Uh, great advice there. Uh, really appreciate you to tie in with Iowa football. And uh, as everyone on the phone call can imagine, uh, it's a pleasure working with Tom every day. And uh, these uh, tips are always very helpful. So thank you, Tom. We appreciate it. Uh, next, I'd like to get into announcements. Uh, I'd like to start, uh, first of all, if we can today, with uh, an update from the United Way. Uh, Tricia, do we have you on, Tricia, or uh, Katie? I am on. It's Trish. Um, happy to share what's what's the latest and the greatest. Um, we did our second round of food donations this last um, Monday with uh, Shelter House. So the Coralville Marriott Convention Center prepared 75 individual packed lunch meals. Uh, they included, and you're going to get some pictures here just so you know. I think uh, Barb's sharing her screens, but they included in those boxes there that are marked square. Uh, a wrap, um, which could be a turkey wrap or a ham wrap or even a vegetarian option, as well as an apple and chips um, and a couple more little items in there. And we were graced with the presence of Craig Sundell. He's the gentleman up in the truck there. Uh, he's the general manager of the Marriott. And then Molly Horton, who oversees events and sales. Uh, both came over and helped unload along with the shelter staff and we were loaded. Uh, into their facility, and so they were very, very excited to receive this donation from Rotary, and we were very, very proud to be the vehicle to help with that donation. So another successful meal distribution. Uh, we have a few more to come. In fact, our last one will be the first week in June, so we're really looking forward to continuing these each week and 
spreading some, you know, Rotarian good cheer to a lot of people who are doing a lot of good things, as well as a lot of people who are very vulnerable in our community. Other updates to share. Um, we will be starting a Mask Up program with United Way. We have a donor from the Community Foundation who has established a name fund, and they're going to be providing all of the supplies to make mask kits. And so by appointment, you'll be able to stop by United Way and pick up a kit of 10 to make 10 masks, um, and then return those masks when completed, and we'll be distributing them out to the nonprofit community. As you can imagine, like many businesses in our community, they are struggling to have enough PPE equipment for their employees. And so we're doing our best to connect people to that effort and to be able to support them to be safe. So that's something that's gonna be coming up soon. Um, and then just finally, uh, just a quick announcement for our daily weekday emails that we have been sending out since March 16th. We will be pivoting those to a once a week email. So those will be going out on Tuesdays and we'll be doing that for the next couple of oh, two or three weeks and then make an assessment as to where we need to go from there. And these emails that'll be once a week will be really focusing on making sure anybody who is reopening businesses or having community involvement in any way, shape or form has the proper information they need to be safe and healthy. With that, I'll turn it back over to you, Jim. Great, thanks for the update, Trish. Appreciate all that you do. Um, uh, Barb, do you have any other announcements? Uh, as of right now, we don't. Just a reminder, if people have an announcement, you can go to the participant button and click on raise your hand. You can send me a private message or you can just speak. Yeah, I'll just open done. it up for a a minute. Does anyone, uh, did we miss anyone? Anybody have an announcement or a guest that we missed before we get into our program? Okay, seeing none. Uh, very excited to transition into our program here. Uh, we've got uh, 30, 35 minutes. Ideally, uh, we will be able to allow time for questions. Uh, this is a lot of interest in today's program, so hopefully uh, by about 12.45 or 12.50, we'll be able to open up the floor to questions. So again, we just have people uh, raise their hand virtually uh, at the bottom of the screen uh, if you have a question at the end of the, of the program. So for our introduction of our uh, speaker today, I'll turn it over to Madeline Windauer. Madeline? Thank you, President Jim. Um, Barb, can you tell me if you can hear me okay? I can hear you. Great. Um, if you have not already toggled to speaker view at the upper right of your screen, you might want to do that now. Uh, our speaker today is Joe Heath, producer of the upcoming feature film, Iron Men, the story of Niall Kinnock and the famed 1939 Iron Men team. Born and raised in Iowa City, Joe got his start in entertainment, working as an actor and a model, commuting to Minneapolis and Chicago. In the fall of 2006, he moved to LA to pursue a career in film, after spending the summer on the set of the final season. He learned firsthand what it takes to make a movie, working his way up from a production assistant. Since returning to Iowa City in 2010, he has helped produce and crew several independent films, short films, and commercials while developing projects of his own. Most recently, associate producing The Quarry, starring Michael Shannon and Shea Wiggum in theaters April 17th and executive producing Masquerade, starring Bella Thorne, Olivia Allen, and Austin Nichols, with an expected 2020 release date. Please join me in welcoming Joe Heath. You ready for me? <laughs> Go for it. All right. Um, yeah, I'm Joe Heath. Uh, I am working to produce the feature film Iron Man that is, um, like Madeline said, about Niall Kinnick and the 1939 Iron Man team. Um, it's been a long journey uh, to get to this point, and um, we still have a long way to go. So I guess um, I plan on just kind of telling you where we started and where we've come and where we plan to go down the road. Um, as Madeline said, I, uh, I started working in film. It was always a dream of mine. And I, I started working in film and doing what I could uh, here locally and in the Midwest. And, um, and then when the movie, the final season came to Norway and Cedar Rapids to, 
film the story of the Norway baseball team. Um, I made my way onto that set uh, through a lot of persistence and phone calls and emails and whatnot. And I, um, I ended up meeting my mentor on that set who um, he actually told me way back then in 2006, he's like, you're not going to be an actor. You're going to be a producer. Um, and I said, what's a producer? And, uh, and then um, he said, well, why don't you uh, come out to LA and um, you know, you can pursue your dreams and you can work with me and I'll, you know, I'll teach you how to, how things are done. And um, so three weeks later, I, I actually hopped on a motorcycle and packed a duffel bag and I, I headed out to Los Angeles and, um, you know, tried to make my way of it. So um, the very first thing I did when I got there is I, uh, I ended up at my friend Kenny Burke's house, um, who was the production manager of the final season. And he said, what movies do you have to make? And um, I pitched him Niall Kinnick, I pitched him the Dan Gable story, and I pitched him uh, the Sullivan Brothers story. Um, those are kind of my three dream projects, my Iowa-rooted projects that I would like to tell and, and retell someday. Um, and his response was great, his response specifically to Niall Kinnick was, um, great story, nobody cares. And, uh, you know, I took a moment and I, I thought to myself, no, people care. Like, um, you know, I, I grew up in Iowa City. I, I've seen the fan base and um, I know that, that people care. Uh, so I kept pursuing it and pitching the story everywhere I went. And I would get the same answer. This is a great story, but nobody cares. Where's your audience? Who cares? You know? and um, and that went on for a long time while I was in Los Angeles and I worked on other projects and I kept learning and learning and learning. And, um, and then in 2008, there was a writer strike, uh, which actually at the time, uh, I didn't know it, but it, it probably prepared me for this quarantine a little bit because everything shut down and, and I was out of work for a hundred days. And it was, it was like, um, it was kind of, like I said, it was a pre-run of this. Uh, I just didn't know it at the time. Um, so uh, I made my way back to Iowa and I worked here and we had just had the, the flood in 2008. And um, I worked here while I was working to go back to Los Angeles. And eventually I made my way back to Los Angeles and I um, continue to work in the movie industry and TV industry, mainly as a production assistant and as an extra on uh, a lot of TV shows, um, just doing anything I could to uh, pay the bills and keep pursuing my passion. And, and one thing I realized during all of this is that my mentor was exactly right. And I was, um, I was more drawn to the business and producing side of it, which the gist of a producer is um, to take an idea and then bring it to fruition. Like um, you're basically a small businessman and every, every idea you have, you, you build up and you find people that support it and you, you start up the LLC and you go out and you raise funds and you get a script in place and you hire all the people to, to make the machine run. And then um, the final step, to the beginning of the process is you get them all in one place and you start filming a movie. Um, so I, uh, I started being more drawn to this and, um, why I was back in Iowa city, I, I met a girl. So, um, after a little while I realized that, uh, um, she was going to be my wife and I, I moved home and I, uh, was just working here in Iowa city. Uh, actually I was doing home remodeling and plumbing and, just kind of pushing movie stuff forward as like a, a passion hobby sort of thing at the time and just kept working and working and building up. And um, I was actually uh, had a job at the hospital at the time. And um, I want to say this is about 2011. Uh, I was working the night shift and um, I was walking to work at night and they had the South end zone closed down because they were getting ready to install the new Jumbotron. And that day, uh, I thought to myself, I thought, 
how, what's the world record for a movie audience? What's the world record for a movie premiere? And the reason I thought this is because the Hawkeye fans had just set a world record for the Hokey Pokey at Fry Fest. And I thought, you know, if we can get people together, that many people and do a Hokey Pokey, like how would these fans react to having a premiere of a Niall Kinnick movie in this stadium? Um, so I called back out to Los Angeles and I, I told my mentor about my idea. And, um, and he said, you know what, let's take this back to the studio and see what they think. And they loved the idea of doing this um, and having a way to like really pu publicize a, like a movie and um, kind of put it on a big stage and, and get it out there, um, you know, before having to spend all the advertising dollars. And I was like, oh yeah, we're gonna make this, it's gonna happen. And they said, you know, get us a script in place and um, get us, uh, you know, and, and find the money to make it. And I was like, oh, okay, here we are back to square one. Um, so I kept pursuing um, putting this film together. And during this time, uh, Tom Lid released the book, Nile. Um, and I found this book when I was at the public library. I'd walked out of a film group meeting down there in Iowa City, and I, uh, I went and I checked out all the books on Niall Kinnick, and I was, you know, I was really trying to make a push of bringing this thing back alive now that I had some interest in, in helping move it forward. And um, so from there, I found Tom's book, and I read the book, and the thing that really stuck with me in reading it was that Niall Kinnick really wasn't the story so much as I had thought originally. And the, the story was really that team in 1939. And as I, uh, you know, as I dug into his book, I, I realized that there were so many characters on that team um, from Erwin Prosse to Mike Enoch to Jim Walker to their coach, Dr. Eddie Anderson, that were just so interested in, in engaging. Um, and I thought, you know, this is the story. This, this book is where it's at. So um, I, uh, I set out to get in touch with Tom Lid, which didn't go very well. Uh, I, I found um, contacts to get to his last employer and, and I reached out to them and they said, oh, he doesn't work in here anymore. And, um, and we don't have a contact for him. So that kind of that kind of sizzled, but at the same time, I was working to approach the university and the athletic department about um, the potential of doing a premiere in the stadium, since we had got the interest from studios in in doing that. And uh, after a lot of effort, I ended up being put in touch with Mark Jennings, who was um, the former uh, associate athletic director. And he absolutely loved the idea right off the bat. And he happened to be friends with Tom Lid. So he said, let's get you guys together. And um, he set up a lunch and we, we met down at Mickey's for lunch and we talked about the Ironman and Niall Kinnick and just how much the story meant to both of us. And, uh, and I said, you know, would, would you be able to, you know, give me a handshake option on your book and I'll, I'll put a script together and we'll try to move this thing forward. And he was all for for it. So, um, so I I dug into the process of writing the first draft, and I basically just took his book and I um, broke down every scene and put it into screenplay format. And um, after this is a long process, so after several months of work on this and getting it together, I I went back to Tom and and um, I said, hey, I got a first draft. I said the only problem is I. And he cut it in half. It's about 120 pages too long. And he said, can I read it? And I said, of course you can. Um, and he, he picked it up and he, he read through it, which uh, was, you know, looking back, probably a very tedious task at the time because it was very unpolished. And he said, Joe, this is, this is my book. This is dead on my book. And I said, exactly what it is, is your book. And I, I said, now we just got to, one thing that's very important to me in telling the story is we got to, we got to cut the fiction out of your book. Um, I said, this is a story that's worth telling and it's worth telling honestly because, because it's there already. So um, we went back through and 
some of the stuff he did in the book were just very simple things like having freshmen play their freshman year because um, just the characters like Al Coupe were so compelling that he just wanted to get them in there sooner. Um, so we went back and, and reworked it all and we ended up bouncing the script back, uh, back and forth for, it was probably a year and a half, two years um, before we finally had you know, probably the hundredth draft, but what we called our first draft. And I, uh, I marched it into the athletic department and I, I gave it to the secretary and I said, I, I want to get this to Mark Jennings. Um, he's aware of this project and I just wanted to let him know we're moving it forward. And, and he called me up and he was so excited, you know, that we had a script and process. He said, Oh, I thought this thing had died. And I said, no, it just, you know, it takes a lot of work to move these things forward. So, now that we had a script, um, you know, it was time to start building the business. And, and we opened up an LLC and then, you know, went out and um, we were able to, you know, do what I'm doing now and just go out and speak at different events and to different clubs and, you know, tell people what we had going on. And we were able to gain some interest in, in the project and in the vision of what we were trying to do. And um, from that, we, uh, We've just been working and working, and we um been reaching out to through the Iowa network and through um, people in the industry with Iowa ties and just by doing stuff like this, like I said, to just spread the word and spread the word and spread the word um, until eventually we got put in touch with Nicholas Meyer, who is a famed u of I alumni from the writer's workshop and an oscar nominated um, writer for his uh, adaptation of Time After Time, which is one of his many Sherlock Holmes novels. I, I believe he just released his 48th Sherlock Holmes novel last fall. Um, and uh, I was able to go out to Los Angeles for um, an Iowa filmmaker meetup. And while I was out there, Nick agreed to meet with me. And so I, I headed over to Nick's house and, you know, we sat down with a coffee and and he, uh, he said, I heard you want me to write a football movie. And I said, well, rewrite, and yes. And he, he looked me dead in the eyes and he said, are you crazy? <laughs> he said, the only thing I know about football is I like to attend games and I like to have a hot dog and a beer. And I said, well, Nick, um, my thinking is that we already have the football in place and there's not much that you have to do with that because that story is already written what we're looking to do is to have you come in and just polish the story and build the characters and, um, you know, just make it a cohesive movie. Um, this is a very important figure in the state of Iowa. And like was mentioned before, he's probably one of the all time role models, um, which subverting back was one of my huge drives to push this forward. It was, uh, the influx of superhero movies, um, all these superhero movies, one after another, after another. Um, and I would always think to myself, you know, I want my kids to have heroes that aren't wearing a mask. There are real people that you can look up to and see that, you know, they actually achieved this stuff. And Niall Kinnick, um, you know, he was really a man before his time and he was a man that I think one of his greatest attributes was uh, his selflessness and his ability and passion to just show up for everybody in his circle, for everyone in his, in his community, his family, his teammates. Um, during his time at the University of Iowa, he was the class president his senior year. He was the head of the Pum Young Republicans. He did all his uh, all the things he did on the football field. and. Um, you know, he was a man that had a lot of offers on the table, but in the end, he really wanted to go to law school and follow in his grandfather's footsteps and, and go into politics and, and help make the world a better place. And I, and I thought, you know, these are the messages and heroes that I want my kids to look up to. And, and if, uh, you know, if I can help to tell one of these stories, I'm gonna. So Nick, uh, Nick picked up the script and he, um, he said, look, I'll give it a read and I'll tell you what I think. And I, I said, oh, that'd be amazing, you know. Um, and he said, well, you know, don't plan on hearing anything soon. Uh, so I, 
I said, you know, that's, you know, that's fine. And uh, lo and behold, um, a couple of weeks later, I got an email from him and he said, oh man, I read through this thing and this is great. This is a great all American story. Um, this is my meat and potatoes. And I, I really think I could do something with this script. And I said, well, would you be interested in write, doing a rewrite and directing it? And he said, you know, I'll do the rewrite, but I, I don't think I'm your guy to direct it. Um, so it went back to him and, um, and, uh, and we had the offer on the table and I, I took it back to some people that had invested in the project and um, said, hey, uh, how do you feel about us spending a whole bunch of money to uh, bring in this amazing writer and, and you know, do this story justice? Because um, as that was always the plan was to do everything we can to not only tell this story, but tell it in the best possible way because we we knew that you know you only get one chance to do something like this and we we really wanted to do it right so so they said heck yeah do it um you know that that money's just sitting in an account and it's sitting there for for you to use to do the best you can to move this forward so we went back to to nick and um and he had given me notes on it and like i said all his notes were just right in the realm of the things i was thinking but um at the same time, I, I wanted to hear those same thoughts and notes from somebody that we were going to entrust in, in really telling the final version of this story. Um, so Nick took it and um, he uh, once again um, came back extremely fast with a, with a rough draft. We actually... Um, Two years ago at FryFest, um, I was sitting in a booth telling everybody about what we're trying to do. And while I was sitting in that booth, I was exchanging emails with Nick Myers, trying to finalize a deal to bring him on as a writer. And we, we were able to get it done that day. And um, right after uh, Bob Stoops got done talking up on the podium, we were able to announce that we just hired Nicholas Meyer to come on and write our script. And um, sure enough, uh, November 3rd, he sends me a first draft, which was kind of scary be, because it it triggered uh, another large payment in the process and it, it had come back so quick that I was very nervous upon reading it. Um, but I, I sat down and started into it and uh, just a few pages in, I was, I was high-fiving my wife and I said, oh my gosh, this guy this guy put it together. This is, this is the story we need to tell. And, um, that was this here, our, uh, what he says, the first draft and it's, you know, based on Tom and I's screenplay that was based on his novel Nile. And then, um, you know, from there it was, it was back to doing what I'm doing here, which is just telling everyone that's happened and, you know, turning every stone over and just moving the process forward. Um, in doing this, we've uh, gotten a lot of no's from a lot of big time talent, but we've gotten a lot of yeses. And one of those yeses came from uh, Teresa Peters, who's um, one of the owners of United Talent Agency. And she said, yeah, here's a list of A-list actors that would love to be in this. And um, like I said, we've just been moving it forward. We, we stumbled upon a kid named Shane Graham, who's uh, relatively unknown, but he's a dead ringer for Niall Kinnick and, and I sent him the script and he said, yeah, I'd love to be a part of this. And, and then from there, um, we were able to get a director in uh, a man named Shane Dax Taylor, who not only is he a narrative film teller um, and has several films under his belt. He, uh, he was um, hired out of college to produce for ESPN. So he spent 15 years before he went into film producing football games and basketball games, including several Hawkeye games. And, and he was aware of the fan base and just what we were doing. So, uh, so he came on and uh, me and him have been working together on several projects, including Masquerade that uh, Madeline had mentioned, um, which features art from Iowa City artist, uh, Charlie and Tomas Lozanski throughout it. Um, and we're hoping to finish that one up here soon and then have it released. The um, 
so yeah, that's, uh, that's where we are, what we're doing. One of the things that we're hoping to do is with this great fan base, we're um, trying to get as many people involved as possible. So we plan on having opportunities for films or uh, for fans and students to come out and be extras in the film. Um, you know, once it's, once it's happening, um, right now with the situation going on in the world, uh, the pitcher's foggy as to when that's happening again um, and when it will happen as we, uh, we have so many people in a small confine when we're, when we're starting to make a movie that um, we, you know, we just got to wait and see what the, what the health and safety issues of that are going to look like before we move forward. But our plan is to eventually um, get the movie in a production and we're going to, film here on campus to do our crowd scenes, our pep rally scenes, and uh, the idea is to eventually shoot the final scene on campus, uh, pep rally scene, and then have a little bit of a fireworks show. And um, uh, we're working with the downtown district and our goal is to have a, a citywide rap party, kind of like they do with the downtown block party, and just make a whole thing of it. Um, there's not a lot of Iowa movies out there. The big ones are Field of Dreams and Bridges of Madison County. And those films are 25 and 30 years old and still being celebrated. And there's still a point of tourism in our state. And um, my thinking and the downtown district and the mayor's thinking was that this can be the same thing. And, and we can really make it a point of pride for our community and um, a way to bring tourism and economic dollars into the community as well as ultimately um, have the big premiere in Kinnick Stadium and hopefully uh, um, bury the current world record for a movie audience, which is 33,624. Um, so that's, uh, that's who I am, what we're doing, and the odyssey that has gotten us here. Um, I uh, can answer any questions that anyone has about it. All right. Great job, Joe. It's exciting. Congratulations on uh, all you've done so far, and thank you. Uh, exciting to be to hear from you. Uh, I, we can open it up for questions. We've got ten minutes for questions here. Uh, if anyone has questions, please uh, click the raise hand button. And uh, Barb, can you just call on uh, folks that have their uh, hands raised? Uh, right now, it doesn't look like we have any uh, hands raised. So, um, Joe, I do have a question. Can you tell me again the name of the person that you have kind of tagged to play Niall Kinnick? Um, his name's Shane Graham. Uh, he is a young actor. Um, his, his probably his most notable thing is he was in, well, he's been doing it for a long time, but he was in Shark Boy and Lava Girl way back in the day. And then I discovered him from... Um, a service I have called IMDb Pro where you kind of punch in the physical attributes that you're looking for and it it kicks up uh, it kicks up different options and and that actually um, um, the way we found him was uh, I had a little bit of heartbreak in um, we had our script with Josh Hutcherson who played Peter in the Hunger Games and he's on Future Man and he's been in a lot of things and we were looking to, to cast him in the role of Niall Kinnick and uh, I got a late night call from his manager and I was like, Oh my God, like, I think we got a Niall. And, and instead of it being that it was, um, it was him saying, Hey, not what we're looking to do right now. Um, so I, like I said, I pulled up this service and we stumbled upon Shane and I thought, you know, this, this is, this kid is just, he's a dead ringer. Uh, he's a half inch shorter but that'll just help us play up the, the little guy aspect of Niall because that's one of the the very amazing things about this guy that, you know, he played every minute of every game there in 39. Uh, and he was only five foot eight, 170 pounds, which wouldn't even get you looked at by most uh, college recruiters these days. Um, well, Joe, I just, since you gave him his name, I'm going to share my screen here. Um, hopefully this has come up. Do you guys see the images here that I have of yes. this is him? And I think you're right. He really does look quite a bit like Niall Kinnick. Joe, yeah. I heard I heard a story that uh, is his name Shane. Is that right? Yes, sir. 
I heard a rumor that he tried on one of Niall Kinnick's jackets and it fit perfectly. Is that true or false? That was so true and false. So <laughs> Rodney Leonard's the vice president of the University of Iowa has been very helpful in all this. And part of Rodney's job, uh, when they built the statue outside of Kinnick Stadium, he was tasked with the job of overseeing it. So he became very close with the artist that made it. And uh, the day that they uh, unveiled the statue, um, the Letterman jacket that was built to the specs of Niall Kinnick um, was gifted by the artist to Rodney's son. So we brought Shane to town and uh, I said, Rod, is there any way we can slip that jacket on him for, for the meet and greet? And we were down at Tailgaters and we had a little meet and greet down there and Rod came in with that jacket and yeah, he slipped it on and it, it fit him like a glove. Um, and while he was in town, we were able to take him to uh, um, a game here The at, oh gosh, who was the big upset last season? Um, it's slipping my mind at the moment. Minnesota, we were t took him to the Minnesota game and we upset them and, and it was a lot of fun. We were walking around, um, tailgating and introducing him to a lot of people and and people were just taken aback like they'd seen a ghost um because yeah it just it was like it was made to fit him uh so it is that is true uh my tailgate was one that he stopped by we're right by kinnick and he is a spitting image so uh very exciting <laughs> yeah it's it's uncanny um and it you know it'll it'll be fun uh I think he's not only the perfect guy in appearance and talent, I think also um, given that he's a relative unknown, it won't take people out of the story. And that's one thing that I really worried about. And I worried about with Josh Hutcherson is, you know, we kind of were looking to sign him just for monetary reasons and to, to get things made. You attach a name like that, it helps push it forward. But I never really thought he was the best fit. Um, so when we met Shane and then um, the first time I brought him to town to, to talk to him, we, we had Nick was in town doing a reading at Prairie Lights for, like I said, his 48th Sherlock Holmes novel. And I said, oh, well, we got him here. Let's, let's see if we can't do a discussion with Nick and maybe we'll do um, like a script reading or whatnot. And then I said, you know, better yet, let's fly in some actors and, you know, let's perform a few scenes. So last uh, October, we were able to do that down at film scene. And um, yeah, he's just, I, I walked into the airport to pick him up in Cedar Rapids and there was a buzz in the airport and I heard people, oh, you see that guy? He looks, he looks just like Niall Kinnick. And nobody had a clue what he was there for, <laughs> but they all were like, holy moly, this is Niall Kinnick. Um, and it, you know, it's just, um, I'm a firm believer that things, you know, happen when they're supposed to and work out the way they should. And, and uh yeah, I, I think he's our guy, and you know, I I look forward to uh, you know getting it into production, and like I said, ultimately premiering it for a packed Kinnick Stadium, uh, you know, before it heads into theaters. Sounds great. great. Why do we have more questions? Hands raised. We do. We have a question from John Fraser. John, if you could unmute your microphone. Uh, thanks, Barb. Uh, Joe, uh, first of all. We're talking about role models. I would suggest you're a role model for persistence and tenacity and uh, sticking to your vision. This is amazing. You, you mentioned some filming will be done on campus. Obviously, uh, we're playing in a stadium now that didn't exist back in the days of the Ironman. Where do you picture that set being for the, uh, the field that looks like it really did back in those days? Well, the Ironman played in Kinnick Stadium. It was Iowa Stadium at the time. Um, most of what we film as far as football action will, uh, we're going to film most of the movie down in Louisiana to take advantage of tax credits. Uh, they'll give us 40% back on our money, um, spent. So basically what we're going to be able to do is shoot a $22 million movie for $15 million by filming most of it down there. So most of the football will be shot on a sod farm, I presume, and we'll, put shipping containers out and we'll wrap them in green screen and we'll build in the background afterwards. 
Um, a lot of the Kinnick Stadium that does exist, we can still shoot. Uh, the east side especially, we can use a lot of it. And then um, the stands, once they're full of people in period garb, we can shoot it to make it look like it did back then. Okay, it looks like we have another question from Steve Bowers. Steve? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Uh, coincidentally, you guys sat next to us at the uh, Minnesota football game this last year. And I was- You're behind us? We were just down, a uh, couple of people down from where you guys were sitting. And he had on the letter jacket at the time. And he was a spitting image. My, my only question was, I was surprised how small he is. And I didn't realize now Kinnick was that small of a person. Yeah. But, um, and even reading the stat line, until you see him in person, <laughs> or somebody the same size in person, you, you don't realize how small he is. And, um, you know, I think that's one of the big things that just makes it so much more amazing is, you know, I always tell people uh, now, Kinnick, what he did will never be created and recreated by anyone. Mm, sure. But if you wanted to have a season like that again, you'd have to take, um, you know, <clears throat> what uh, Desmond King did and combine that with what Brad Banks did and, and then stick Nate Kading's Lou Groza winning season all in one to, to replicate what Niall Kinnick did in one mm -hmm. year. And, you know, it's just something that'll never ever be done again. And I, you know, there's been a lot of football movies out there. I, I truly believe that we have the best untold story in football. And it's, it's just been parked here in the Midwest for 80 years. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm very thankful to, you know, it's, it's hasn't been easy to push it along this far, but I'm very thankful to just have the opportunity to, to be a part of it and to, to tell the story and to work with such great people like Nicholas and the university to, to just do it right. And, um, and have an opportunity to like bring all the fans in and, and show all those people that told me, you know, 12, 13 years ago that nobody cares that people care. And like Niall Kinnick, they'll show up for it. Um, and I, you know, I'm very excited to, to do, do, do you do much about his Navy experience and the flight training and that kind of stuff? We do. Um, one of the ideas I had was uh, to have him in, in the cockpit and, you know, the, the scene of him going down. Um, we kind of bookend our story with that. And we, my, my, the idea I picked to Nick, pitched to Nick was why don't we, you know, have it bounce back to that here and there. And Nick took that idea and he, he ran with it one further and he had it about, we start and end with that, but he had it bouncing back to um, a medical field tent outside of Paris where Dr. Eddie Henderson was stationed and working on injured uh, soldiers. And we have Dr. Eddie Anderson finding out about what's happening via a nurse that's reading the stars and stripes to a, to an injured uh, infantryman. And, um, so the story is told from the viewpoint of Dr. Eddie Anderson, who, like I mentioned, um, this is a guy that it, once again, like people like this just don't exist anymore. He was a practicing medical doctor and a college football coach. Yeah. Um, and it's just, you know, <clears throat> like the time that he must have put in to move these endeavors forward. It's just, uh, it's just insane, but yeah, we touch on his medical, on his military career. Um, we touch on the fact, you know, that he walked away from so many things. He finished law school third in his class his first year. And before they started drafting people, he said, I'm signing up. And he went out, you know, and he became a naval air fighter and um, ultimately, you know, died on his last training mission before he was to see battle. His, uh, his plane lost pressure and as the story goes, he, he came, was coming back to the, the aircraft carrier and the runway wasn't clear. So, um, you know, he wasn't going to put anyone at risk. He made a, a textbook water landing, they said, and the, the plane piked and um, they were there in four minutes and there was nothing but an oil slick, um, you know. And one thing that 
all his teammates and uh, people that I've read about their stories of him, everyone believed that he would have gone on to be the president of the United States and really changed this country and the world for the better. One other question about timetable. In a perfect world, when would you like to see this uh, finished? Um, So our plan going into this was to shoot this summer fall uh, and turn it around and premiere it in 2021 and then head to theaters. Um, That's not an option at this point. Um, I'm involved in several other projects and, um, you know, everyone's bouncing stuff around and they think that it's going to be September at the earliest before um, anyone's going to be on a film set again. Uh, And it it just... It, it, won't, uh, it won't meet our timeline to get production off this year. Um, so we're hoping next summer, fall, you know, to get back into, you know, um, like so many people right now, we're just, we're just kind of at the whim of uh, what's happening with the world. And we're, we're waiting it out and just trying to keep moving it forward in the meantime and, uh, you know, keep trying to keep adding to our cast and um, our crew and, and just building our team because, uh, Filmmaking is really a team sport, uh, and you know, it, so yeah. I don't have a set timeline, but you know, I'd like to get it off uh, next summer, and hopefully, you know, really, I think at that point, um, the world and our community will will really just embrace being together and being able to celebrate things as a community and being a part of things again. So. Like I said, I, I believe everything falls into place when it should. And, and uh, one thing I've learned through the process is uh, trying to rush anything just slows it down. So um, my job as a producer and moving it forward is basically just to uh, keep working as hard as I can to get the right pieces lined up and, and you know, let it come through as, as it should. Um, the only thing that I'll be rushing is once we get into production every day, it's a rush to make sure you get stuff done because like anything, you have a limited time and a limited budget. And, and my number one job as a producer, once we're in production is to make sure we stay on time and on budget. Joel, great job. Uh, very exciting. I think uh, uh, we had a hundred people watching you at one time here. So you've got at least a hundred more fans today that are, Looking forward to hearing more about this. So thanks so much and great job. And yeah, uh, we appreciate your time. You bet. Well, we always end our meetings with the uh, reciting of the four-way test. So uh, of the things we think, say, or do, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and build better friendships? Will it be beneficial? Thanks, everyone. And our meeting's adjourned. If you didn't check in, make sure you sign in on the chat. Thank you. Thanks, Barbara. You bet. Thank you, Joe. That was really interesting. Thanks. Barb, thank you. That was a really, really great program. Loved yeah. it. It was. Thanks to Devin, our program coordinator, and Madeline, who introduced and probably brought this idea forward. So really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. I did just get, uh, for those of you still on, um, I got an interesting email from one of our members. Let me see if I can share it. It actually has a side by side of, um, can you see it? Of the actor oh, and wow. not in it. Look at that. That's amazing. Isn't that great? Yeah. You know, he actually put this side by side together and sent it out to me. Um, Cause once he read the story, he, he, you know, he's like, I have to do this, you know? It is. It is really striking how close he looks to him. It's that's really great. Really interesting. I'm always. I work for the College of Business, so I'm always proud that he was an economics major. And you know, I love the fact that that statue has all those books beside him. You know, as well. So. Yeah, he definitely was a guy that you know did it right, and you know he was here to be a student, and um, you know he. Uh, he wanted to help people make the world a better place. And I, I think, you know, that's a, 
always a story worth telling. Yeah, it really is. Uh, we had an alum who actually, who has since passed, but he uh, was a classmate of Niles. And, you know, which that's, it's pretty rare. Um, they're typically around 100 years old if you meet them. Um, but it was pretty fascinating to meet somebody who went to class with Niall Kinnick, so. Yeah, I, I, uh, every time I meet somebody that's uh, related to him or knows him, one of um, the Ironman, uh, Erwin Prosse, one of his granddaughters came out um, to a little casting call we did uh, last summer. Um, we want to put some Iowa natives in little bit roles and uh, some of those, one of those roles was uh, Grant Wood and Elizabeth Catlett. And uh, one of his grandchildren and daughter, he had 10 children and they all live in the, the Naperville area. And they came in and one of his granddaughters um, came in just to, she didn't fit either of the parts. They just wanted to come in and, you know, thank me for doing it because all these guys that were paying tribute to all of them. Um, like I said, they were all great men and every player and coach served in the in world war ii after after this except for one coach that had a glass eye and wasn't allowed and it and you know that's beyond the football that's we're telling that story of the greatest generation and just all the sacrifices that that were made and and you know just trying to tell a story of of selflessness and and helping others and and just really showing up is what i always tell people um there's a scene in the movie where um, Dr. Eddie Anderson is meeting all the players and and he says, "Now you're not very big, you're not very fast, what do you do? And he said, I show up. And, and it's right there, that's, you know, kind of our tagline and and um, the heart of the story is is just being there for for everyone that you have the opportunity to be there for. That's great. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for coming and telling your story to our club. All right. Thank you so much, Barbara. You bet. Have a great day. You too. Thanks, everybody. Hope you have a great day. Goodbye, Barb. Bye, Bernie. <laughs> you want to hear